Hi, thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction, Emma. Um, so yeah, Kate and I will be discussing Yemen predominantly just to connect the dots between what we've sort of already heard about Scotland's complicity in the arms trade um, and the human costs in Yemen. So um, I'll just spend about five minutes just sort of introducing the situation in Yemen um, and then Kate will move more towards um, the arms trade in Scotland and the UK. Um, so this year and this week, in fact, um, marks six years of the war in Yemen. It started when the Houthis took over Sana'a in September 2014 and the Saudi airstrike campaign um, began um, in March 2015. Um, the most sort of up-to-date statistics I could find are uh, that nearly 250,000 Yemenis have been killed, uh, millions have been internally displaced, and 24 million are at risk of famine. Um, and for reference, Scotland's population is just below 5.5 million people. So if you can imagine how big that is, um, that's just for reference. I really, really want to underline that as we've sort of touched on, perhaps touched on in other panels today, Yemenis are being deliberately starved. The Saudis blockade on Yemen's borders have prevented food, medical aid and gas from getting in the country. The Houthis will steal this aid if they're if it does do get through and sell it on the black market. Then the prices of essentials such as food, medicine, and gas have absolutely skyrocketed. So people can't even afford them if they can get in, if they can get past the black market. And public sector workers have gone without salaries for years. This includes doctors and um, medical staff. There's been high levels of explosive violence from all sides. This includes bombing, shelling, snipering of civilians as well, and grave human rights violations from all sides. Um, some of the conflict actors include the Houthi rebels. Um, they terrorize Yemenis, particularly women and prisoners, journalists, and really anyone they view as a threat. Um, there's a de facto Yemeni government as well who are operating out of Saudi Arabia at the moment. Um, they are corrupt, they engage in money laundering and they divert funds and aid. Um, and when I again like to sort of highlight the facts that when Yemenis desperately need aid, when their aid's being cut off, their aid is being embezzled by the de facto government. Um, and finally, the Saudi led coalition, who may know a little bit about, it's um, supported by the US and the UK through arms sales, um, a plethora of Arab states and militaries. Um, and that sort of membership changes um, it has changed over the last six years. The UAE, for example, will say they've pulled out, but they still operate uh, secret prisons as well. Um, and sort of as Emma said, I have I, my sort of focus is on Yemeni women um, activists, journalists, uh, leaders. Um, I want to sort of add that Yemen has always been quite a tough place to be a woman, but gender-based violence has increased because of the upheaval due to the war. Some of the sort of more recent developments um, that you may have seen in the news um, are that the US has halted arms sales temporarily um, to Saudi Arabia and has started to talk about increasing aid to Yemen, but there is a narrative of Saudi Arabia defending itself um, and that, ex that still exists and that potentially could hint that arms sales may resume in the future. It's not sort of a complete promise. Again, you might have seen sort of more closer to home, um, the UK has slashed aid to Yemen um, at the beginning of March from 164 million pounds last year to 87 million pounds this year. That takes a massive toll on Yemenis who rely on the aid to survive. Um, finally, the COVID pandemic has taken a significant death on Yemenis. The numbers are not clear, but Yemen already had such a limited healthcare infrastructure um, and, it, and like I said, with uh, healthcare workers going without salaries, um, hospitals have been bombed as well. There are multiple epidemics of cholera and diphtheria ravaging the population, and this just absolutely does not help. Um, and finally, the UK is continuing to supply arms, which is where I will pass on to Kate to go more into depth. Thank you so much, Yasmin. I apologize, everyone. I've got a surprising amount of sunshine coming through my window for Scotland. <laughs> So hopefully you can still see my face. Um, so this it's been a really, really devastating war. We really can't overstate that. What Yasmin has described has been horrific. Um, and throughout the war, the UK government has not only continued selling weapons to some of the main conflict actors, Saudi and UAE, it's actually increased the numbers 
of exports of weapons that we sell to these countries. So we think, um, so we know that the UK government has licensed almost 7 billion uh, pounds worth of weapons to Saudi since the war began, but that's actually just, just the, the licenses that we know about. There's also an open licensing system, which means that the value is probably closer to something like 16 billion worth. The kinds of things that the UK government has been selling uh, throughout the war are missiles, bombs and grenades, and also uh, aircraft, so fighter jets, uh, helicopters and drones. And in addition to the weapons that the government, the UK government has been selling, we, uh, the UK government has also been providing technical support uh, by providing staff from BAE systems to support the Saudi Air Force. And these aircrafts and bombs and technical support, they've been used by the Saudis and the UAE and others in a brutal air campaign, which has seen widespread and systematic attacks on civilian targets and huge numbers of violations of international humanitarian law and human rights. So there were points during the war where there was an airstrike by the Saudis every 100 minutes. Um, and these were hitting more non-military or civilian targets than military ones. So we're talking airstrikes that have been hitting hospitals, like Yasmin says, uh, markets, funerals, weddings, schools, school buses, and key civilian infrastructure like roads and bridges, food storage and factories, which is helping to starve the population. Um, whole cities have been designated targets by the Saudi coalition, um, and so, which is complete violation of international humanitarian law. And they drop leaflets an hour before they bomb, uh, and they drop leaflets primarily to illiterate populations uh, and to populations that don't have any fuel to leave their, their city. Um, there's also one of the things that, so I've worked on Yemen for about 12 years now. Um, and one of the things that I still find completely heart wrenching is um, there's a lot of talk about Saudis indiscriminately bombing, but actually they're targeting civilians. Uh, and one of the things that they do uh, is they do something called double tapping. And I'm really sorry, anyone who's upset by this. Um, so what they'll do is they'll bomb a hospital, a school, a factory, and they'll wait for the rescue, the, the informal rescue teams to come and try and rescue people, and then they'll bomb the same target again, um, uh, killing the rescue teams and killing anyone that might have survived the first bombing. Um, some of you may have heard, there's a few of these bombings have sort of made international news. There was a massive bombing of a funeral, um, and that funeral bombing that killed over 100 people, uh, that happened just two months after the UK government provided training on international humanitarian law to the Saudis. So while um, the government and the arms companies deliberately make it really difficult to de determine exactly where in the UK weapons have been made, it's certain that parts of bombs and aircraft being used by the Saudis have been made here in Scotland. Um, so as Stefan mentioned, um, fragments of Raytheon paveway smart bombs um, are be, uh, have been found in uh, bombing sites that bomb family homes, uh, bombing sites uh, that, of markets, and also of warehouses and factories. And these fragments can be traced back to the Fife, uh, the Fife factory uh, of Raytheon. Um, we also know that Saudis have been uh, using Eurofighter typhoons, which we know rely on radar systems uh, manufactured on the east coast of Scotland, uh, and infrared targeting tracking devices made on the west coast. We also know that at least 16 companies operating in arms companies operating in Scotland have applied for military export licenses to Saudi coalition members uh, since 2008. So this is this is coming from Scotland. Um, it's not looking like the UK will stop their support to the Saudi campaign anytime soon. Um, Right from the outset of the bombing of Yemen, the foreign secretary at the time, he said, we will support the Saudis in every practical way possible, short of engaging in combat. And that's exactly what they continue to do. And they continue to uh, put weapons into, uh, into uh, a situation where there's growing evidence of war crimes. And actually, they're increasing that support. Um, as Stefan mentioned, the SNP, the ruling party here in Scotland, their 
MPs in Westminster have been really vocal and really supportive um, against UK sales to Saudi. But the SNP government here in Scotland continue to provide huge amounts of support to the same arms manufacturers uh, that are supplying weapons into the Yemen war. Uh, so as Stefan mentioned, Scottish Enterprise is giving millions of pounds of public money uh, to these arms companies, including to Leonardo BAE Systems and Raytheon. Um, and also the Scottish Parliament and government ministers are welcoming with pretty much open arms uh, arms manufacturers in, into Parliament. So there's been uh, numerous meetings with ministers between so SNP ministers, government ministers uh, with arms companies and also multiple lobbying meetings with other parliamentarians. Uh, so we've got a massive hypocrisy uh, happening here in Scotland. Um, and over to Yasmin, who's going to tell us a little bit about what, what are Yemeni activists doing? Thanks so much, Kate. So we can really look at sort of the different ways that people are resisting um, both Yemeni and non-Yemeni and people in Yemen and people not in Yemen as well. Um, at the moment, a lot of sort of activism is taking place online. Um, so activists are making um, use of sort of the online spaces to campaign and share information in panels discussions much like this um, and in social media campaigns. So one of the more recent um, events was the Yemen Day of Rage on the 25th of January this year, um, where there was loads of online action and um, in-person protests globally. Um, Clubhouse is also a, um, an app that's being used as a space to sort of informally discuss activism. Um, and this actually reminded me, I added this to my notes after attending the event last night, but um, it, there's similar sort of sentiments to Arabs who were organizing over Twitter during the Arab Spring um, and sort of using that um, as a place to share like citizen journalism. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. Um, I would like to underline the need for Yemeni activists to lead the organize or to, to lead the yeah, organizing and lead the conversation because ultimately it is Yemenis that should decide the future of Yemen. Um, it is nice to have hope, high profile figures um, speak on Yemen. One example is Jeremy Corbyn will speak quite a lot. He's great. I appreciate seeing that and I appreciate seeing his enthusiasm. Um, and we do need strong allies, but it really is important to listen to and elevate Yemeni voices, especially women and the youth um, who know their country well and they know what their country needs. Um, and particularly when they are being overlooked by white men making the, the decisions, um, one of which is the special envoy, um, Martin Griffiths, um, who tends to be at the forefront of these conversations and making those decisions. Um, activists, both in Yemen and outside of Yemen, are calling on governments to cease arms sales um, and hold the armed factions accountable for their war crimes. Uh, Yemeni activists in the UK are actually not just discussing the war, we're uplifting stories, music, and art, which really helps to, sh like, to show that, um, that Yemen is not just a place of war and violence and poverty. It is a vibrant place, and it, it shows that Yemenis are incredibly resilient. Um, in Scotland in particular, um, diaspora communities do fundraise for specific causes um, and create opportunities for Yemenis in Scotland to connect. Um, one of which that I'm aware of is to Yemen with love. Um, that, so do look that up if, if you have the chance. Um, in Yemen, um, women peace builders have been hard at work. Um, they've been hard at work when their work has not been sort of highlighted by the media. Um, some of the sort of um, small or, uh, smaller actions that do sort of contribute to the overall effort are working like so working with the youth um, to prevent them from joining the armed forces, um, providing food and water aid, um, including things like building water stations in areas that don't have access to clean water, um, helping to rebuild schools and getting children back into education, particularly after these schools have been bombed by the Saudi -led coalition. Um, calling on the international community to work with women peace builders and activists, um, particularly to work towards a gender sensitive peaceful solution. Um, calling for the release of prisoners and detainees and to cease um, the act of kidnapping and abducting. 
um, and then calling for gender-based violence to cease being used as a tool of war. Um, and as I said, sort of in the intro, um, Yemen does not have a good record for gender equality. It has really been exacerbated by um, the by the war and the chaos that sort of ensued. Um, and then peace activists, both men and women, um, are covering and sharing news of airstrikes in sort of a citizen journalist format on Twitter. Um, and so it is difficult to get news out of Yemen. Um, so this is a really great way to get that. Um, and it tends to be, and depending on who sort of is reporting, but sort of the more formal media um, coming out of Yemen is tends to be biased towards one party or another. Um, it's hard to get unbiased news, so we do rely on citizen journalists. Um, and then peace activists are calling on the UN to take more tangible action, not just words, the empty words, um, and recording evidence of human rights abuses committed by the warring parties. So for this final part, I'm just going to hand this over um, back to Kate just to discuss the actions that we can get involved in to show solidarity. Great. Um, thank you so much, Yasmin. That really captures like a really like sense of how much is happening on the ground in Yemen and how we don't we don't talk about that. There's so much peace activism happening in Yemen uh, with women and youth and civil society groups and human rights groups. And we really need to uh, build those relationships and support and provide solidarity where we can. Um, here in Scotland, there's a sense, uh, Stefan mentioned it, there's a, there's a sense that at least the, the public are in a slightly different uh, place than other uh, other audiences, I guess, in, in the UK. And there is there, there was a poll a couple of years ago that suggested that um, the Scottish public are significantly opposed to arms exports to Saudi. And that's really something that we can try and build on, but also turn this kind of public support into tangible change here in Scotland. So although decisions relating to arms exports are reserved to Westminster, there are actually a lot of levers that we have here in Scotland and a lot of things that we can do from here, uh, both in terms of whilst we remain part of the UK and if at one point uh, Scotland becomes an independent country. Um, we have an election coming up. <laughs> it's a rather obvious point, but uh, on the 6th of May, we'll be going to the polls uh, either. <laughs> Probably most of us will be posting our vote um, uh, and we will be electing a new parliament. So we can push, I'm one of those candidates, but I will still be pushing the other candidates in my area uh, to um, make commitments around not just arms exports, uh, to around like that they can apply pressure on Westminster, but to make commitments around reviewing the policies and priorities of our public funds, those Scottish enterprise funds, pushing parties to commit uh, to ending public funds to arms companies uh, and also pushing uh, what will be a new government uh, to start thinking really seriously about that jobs transition, that transition from jobs in arms manufacturing and supporting that transition for workers into renewable energy. So there's a really strong case that a lot, if not all of the workers that work in arms manufacturing here in Scotland could work in renewable energy in uh, tidal and, and wind energy in particular. Um, another thing we can all do as individuals, any of us who has a pension, we should check, particularly if we're a public sector worker, for nurses and teachers, bus drivers, um, check where our pensions are invested and push our pension fund to divest uh, from arms companies. Uh, if we are parents, if we have children at school or uh, if we're at universities ourselves or have children at universities, um, we can also look at the role uh, that arms companies are playing in our schools. So ask the parent teacher councils, are there arms companies coming in and doing STEM education with our children? Do we want someone else to be doing that? Uh, are they coming and doing recruitment fairs in the universities or in uh, high schools or colleges? Um, we can get involved in our local group of CAT. So Scotland has some of the most active uh, local, I'm, I'm biased, but we have like the best groups in the UK by a long way. Uh, so come along to our, uh, like our meetings. We're really lovely, I promise. Like uh, we get up to really, really good stuff. So that um, underwater defense technology arms fair that Stefan mentioned in Glasgow, we shut that down. 
like that's not going to happen again. And that was just a little group of uh, uh, peace activists here in Scotland. Um, and finally, just to reiterate Yasmin's point about seeking out opportunities to listen to Yemeni activists, to be led in our campaigning by Yemeni activists um, and Syrian activists and Palestinian activists and all of the, uh, the uh, places which are horribly affected by weapons um, and seek to build relationships and solidarity um, and to support the people that are documenting these human rights abuses at a lot of risk and also the people that are providing community support. Um, and just to end on, we also need to recognise as uh, British activists that um, the, we don't necessarily totally understand what is happening in these complex uh, conflicts around the world and that there are a plurality of views and we need to make sure that there's space for a plurality of Yemeni views or Palestinian views or Syrian views when we talk about the conflict and not, not everyone will have the same stance um, on the arms trade and that needs to be a, that needs to be a conversation.